My guest today has a unique background. Mitzi Perdue is the daughter of the co-founder and president of the Sheridan Hotel chain. And she is also the widow of another business titan, Frank Perdue, the chicken guy whose products are now sold in more than 50 countries. In today's episode, we talk about her latest book, The Frank Perdue Way, Simple Steps, Super Success. If you copy even one of his ideas, then you'll be ahead of the game. If you copy many of them, and you can experience success beyond your dreams. Welcome to Lifeology. Oh, an absolute joy to be here with you. Thank you. Oh, I'm honored as well. I was so excited to have you on my show. So for me to even read all that, I was like, oh my gosh, so much to say. <laughs> now, where are you calling in from today? Uh, Salisbury, Maryland, which is where Purdue headquarters is. And Purdue being the chicken company. But we also, uh, yeah. we're also a grain company and we're the largest producer of organic chicken in the world. Yes. That is amazing because, you know, when you and I were talking, I don't know, maybe a couple of weeks ago, I was getting your backstory and listening to even about your dad's and Frank's and you both, all three of you have so much in common. Your dad, um, he was told, you know, that he should not do what he should. What he did, what he should do, not be in the hospitality industry. All of a sudden, he did that. Frank was also told that he should not be doing what he's doing. Look at him now. You were also so quiet when you were younger, and now you like to speak to the world, <laughs> which is so amazing. So that's why I was when I was told about you. I was like, oh my gosh, I really want Mitzi on my show because you have you have such a light, and it's always such an honor to see you and be able to, to talk with you. Well, I'm as honored as can be, and also just bursting to share some of the tips that I have that, that, you know, again, as you said in your introduction, if people will copy even one of them, they're ahead of the game. Yeah. But yeah. the tips that I can share are ones that enabled particularly Frank Purdue to go from a father and son operation to one that today mm -hmm. employs, I think it's 21,000 people. That is amazing. Absolutely amazing. Give us a little bit of his backstory. So I know a little bit about it as far as he was, when he was younger, he was told he should not do something or he should move in a different direction. Can you tell us about that and walk us through his success? Okay. In, in Frank's particular case, he started out as a shy farm boy. He, he told mm. me he was so shy that like he had never been in the school play. He, he was wow. an average student. He didn't engage in any of the after school uh, activities that, that most kids do, because as, as one of his contemporaries told me, as soon as school was over, he'd just run as fast as he could a couple of miles back home so that he could help with the farm chores. Well, oh, somebody, wow. yeah, well, somebody who is yeah, a shy person from a farming background in a small town, what did that guy do to become mm -hmm. a global marketing icon? I mean, during the 1980s, 1990s, people used to say yeah. that he was the marketing icon of the world. And That's fantastic. But, but, the, but the odds of somebody from his background becoming a super salesman and a marketing yeah. outcome, I, I would think that they would be zero, but he did it. Wow. And that's a lesson for all of us, regardless of what, what we've been told. I mean, I, for me, I was actually told, I found this out later that I was in graduate school, that my majority of my professors didn't think I would do well. They didn't think that I would cut out to be a psychotherapist. And so I think I've done pretty well. So I think that's a lesson for all of us, regardless of what people say. If you have a dream in your heart, you, there's nothing that can stop you unless you stop yourself. Well, among the things that he was told he couldn't do, he, you know, he was a very tenacious person because mm. I said that he started out as a father and son operation, but he wanted to grow it. He thought that he was producing a quality product and that if people knew about it, that they'd buy it. That was his hunch. Sure. So he thought, how do you communicate with the public that your product is better? Well, that means advertising, mm. but mm. for somebody who was just excessively shy, I mean, he told me that when he had to call on a customer, at least at the beginning, he couldn't even look the customer in the eye. All he could do would be stare at his field boots. Really? So how did somebody like that? Yeah. Can you imagine you're a shy farm boy, but if you want to do advertising, you have to go to New York where the advertising you know, capital is. And you know, it's just a completely foreign world for him. I've had people yeah. tell me that when he first appeared on the scene in New York, that they felt as if he was wearing high button shoes and chewing <laughs> on a straw and just, you know, completely a fish out of water. 
but he hysterical. wanted to do it. And here, and well, but here's what he did, which I think is just so genius, but it's something that anybody else can do. Mm-hmm. I mean, what, once you know this secret, you can copy it. He, fi- he figured out where he wanted to be. He wanted to sell a premium product. You can't charge more for a product unless you can communicate with people why it's better. That yes. meant advertising. So how does mm-hmm. a shy farm boy get to learn about advertising? Well, he told me. He said that he moved to New York, I think for like three months. He'd come home on weekends. But while he was there, the first thing that he did was he accessed one of the major business libraries. New York has oh, a fabulous library system. Of course. And he said that, that he did it because that meant that he could read all the magazines on advertising. Then he could read the books on magazine, the books on advertising. And then to take it one step further, he told me, say there was an article that was just really exciting and interesting, maybe from a professor at Columbia. He'd mm-hmm. go call in the professor and interview him. And then, oh, wow. so you know, he, he probably knew more about advertising than anybody in the poultry business ever before had known. Mm-hmm. But that, that wasn't the end of it. He also, he made a grid of New York City and he marked off where the major butchers were because back in the 1960s, right. the most premium meat mm-hmm. was sold by butchers, not supermarkets. Mm-hmm. And he called on like 90 of them asking them, you know, what do you want to know about so something that would be persuasive? Mm-hmm. Uh, and, but that wasn't the end of it. Then he went to, you know, again, on this map of New York that he had created, he called on all the major television, radio, and newspaper outlets asking what makes a good ad. I mean, so wow. he, he had brilliant. no natural ability in it, but the research meant that he became, how about a world expert in it? Mm-hmm. But then, the, then yeah. the next problem that he faced was you pick an advertising agency. Well, he studied roughly 60 different advertising agencies when he finally wow. settled on one. Yeah. And by the way, we know that it was 60 because the one that he finally settled on, the guy's name was Ed McCabe. He said he and his colleagues were all complaining about how Frank was just badgering them with questions and just being a nuisance. <laughs> but it paid off because... It paid off, yes. But, but then, one, again, we're, we're, all right, but we're right back to the issue of that this is a, a shy farm boy. How does he get to uh, be a TV pitchman? Well, he didn't want to do it. He, the, the copywriter, Ed McCabe, told him, <coughs> Frank... You look like a chicken and you squawk like a chicken. (laughs) It's got to be you. And Frank said, I don't want this. It's funny. I've I've never even been in a school play. I hate public speaking. It can't be me. And Ed McCabe told him, look, (coughs) Ed McCabe told him, Whatever you say about your chickens, your competitors can say them about your chick- their chickens. You know, mine is fresh, mine is fresher. Right. The one thing that nobody can copy is you. Good point. <coughs> because There's said, only one you. you just, mm-hmm. Yeah, you totally relate to your product. I mean, you look like a chicken. Mm-hmm. And, and Frank always thought that was <laughs> terribly <laughs> funny, and he, he played it up. <laughs> that is funny. <laughs> <laughs> I know one of the things he was really good at as well was effective listening. How did that really play out when he was just in his company overall? Because obviously the more, the more effective you are at listening, the more you can hear what your probably what your consumers want. But how did that really play out for him? Actually, in, in the book that I just wrote, The Frank Purdue Way, that's the first chapter. Because this is something that oh, absolutely okay. anybody can do. It doesn't cost you a penny. And it just puts you way ahead of where you'd be otherwise. That's something that I noticed with Frank. And I recommend it to absolutely everybody, even though it's, for me, quite difficult to follow. But here it is. We were married for 17 years until his passing. And I made it a point to notice the following. That in almost any situation, whether it was a board meeting or a sales meeting or talking with a customer Mm -hmm. Or just somebody on the subway, he would talk 10% of the time and listen 90% of the time. Wow. 
And the, the yeah. huge, there, there are a couple of big advantages to this. I mean, I recommend it to everybody. The thing is, when you're listening, you're learning. <coughs> Excuse me. When sure you're not are. listening. But, but there's, there's an advantage even beyond the fact that you're learning. And that great big huge advantage is you're making the other person feel important. You're making yes, you them are. feel valued. There, there's some other right. techniques that he did. And this one, it's just mm-hmm. really important if you're the boss. If, say he's with a meeting of the salespeople, or maybe it's a task force that's mm-hmm. building a new plant. <clears throat> Whatever it was, he wouldn't let people know ahead of time what answer he wanted. Because his attitude is, oh, there's smart. a lot of... Sure. Yeah, that there's a lot of of intelligence and just smarts in this room. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And my job mm-hmm. is to tap into it. And if they know what I want, yeah. I'm not going to get the benefit of, of all their thinking. Is that not cool? That's very, very smart. I mean, obviously that's why he was so successful. I think that's a good point because there are many people who pander or who, uh, whether they realize it or not, you know, you want to want to please the boss. And so if you can read his body language or just maybe listen to some things he may say, all of a sudden you may say something that may not be in the best interest of the company, but it may be in the best interest of what you think he wants to say or wants to hear. And that's not the case at all. Well, I bet a lot of our listeners and me have worked in offices where, where you watch people I mean, I wish it weren't so, but where you watch people turn into a pretzel to say what Mm. they think the boss wants to hear. I bet that happens a huge amount with politicians, for example. Oh, my gosh, yes. But but, but Frank's view was that he had no use for yes men, Mm -hmm. or I suppose yes women. And Mm -hmm. I noticed, you know, I had 17 years to watch the following. The people who stood up to him, who argued with him, those were the ones who advanced in the company because his reasoning was they really care if they're arguing with me, they're giving me yeah, their yeah. best. And I respect that. The person who argued with him the most. Well, actually I want to share a story. This is, uh, this isn't quite about listening. It's more about violence, but we can deal with that. Right. Okay. Of course. Right. Uh-huh. I, I talked with a guy, he was in the sales force for Purdue Farms, and he told me that the week that he started working for Purdue, he thought he had come at a terrible time because he thought the company was just about to fall apart. And I asked, I asked the guy, what do you mean oh, by that? And he said, I was at a sales meeting. There were eight people gathered around a conference table, and at one end was Frank Purdue, and at the other end was a guy named Don Mabe. Well, all morning long, Don Mabe and Frank Perdue had just been arguing, 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 you know, just almost at each other's throats. And the great big culmination of the whole thing was Don Mabe ripped his glasses off, threw the glasses on the table. The glasses bounced once, and they made it all the way over to Frank at the other end of the table, hit his chest. Oh and while gosh. the glasses are in the air, Don Mabe's telling Frank Perdue, why don't you take up hang gliding? In other words, a, a lethal sport. I mean, in other words, it was a really hot and heavy <laughs> argument. And the guy who's telling me this is thinking Sorry. that the company's going to fall apart. Oh, my gosh. And then he was astonished to see at the end of the meeting that Don Mabe and Frank Perdue kind of walked out together just laughing and having a great time. And... I happen to know the rest of that story, which is that Don Mabe and his wife Flo and Frank and I had dinner that night and they were just laughing their heads off over this funny thing about (laughs) a subordinate telling the boss to to take up hang gliding. But there's a PS to this story. That is funny. All right. The first part is Frank had a great tolerance for people who, who insisted who really, who cared enough to resist him. I mean, cause yeah. you have to really, you have to be engaged with the company and want what's best for the company. If you're willing to fight against yes, the guy whose name appears on your paycheck. Yes. Um, but the, the, the great big, huge, like, I don't know, 
lesson from this, no, payoff from this is the, when Frank stopped being CEO and president of the company and went up to being chairman of the board, the person he chose to be president was the person who had argued with him so much his entire career, Don Mabe. And that's amazing. I love that story because it shows the I fact that that's... he holds a grudge. And, yes, and that he totally exactly. respected the people who who would give him their best, even if it meant throwing things at him. <laughs> well, yeah, you know, I, the other thing I really like about, about him as well is he wasn't afraid to get new ideas or he would always look for new ideas. And so I love that because sometimes when when people who are the founder of a company, they may think, well, I know, you know what, what the direction things need to go or the direction the company needs to go. But one thing I know about Frank from you know, speaking with you is that he always was on the lookout for good ideas. I think that's important because that's how we grow and develop as a company or as an organization or as a person is we look for ways in which perhaps other people have done things and then we tweak it to make it ours. And so we make it ours and all of a sudden we can grow and develop in whatever capacity that we're looking for. Well, he told me one of the things that he'd do would be he'd ask competitors, you know, can I see your feed mill? Can I see your processing facility? And they'd all say, yes, mm. it's a professional courtesy. And he would invite them, you know, come to come back and see his. And he said, you know, in his career, he actually got to see hundreds of different facilities because people were kind of, you know, happy to show him around. Mm. But it always astonished him when he said, you know, in my whole career, and, you know, he worked in the company until age 85, which was the time of his passing. Wow. He said that whole time, maybe only three or four people ever asked to see mine. And he found that just amazing that they didn't have the curiosity. Because one of the things that he used to say is, you can learn something important from the worst producer, from the worst facility. You know, everything has got something that you could learn from. And mm -hmm. I just loved it that, that as, as you yeah. were kind of pointing out, that Frank always was into learning. But he was also, he was huge on like reading or, you know, just in every way, whether, whether mm. it was attending conferences or listening to lectures or especially reading. And he also told me that the reading, he was in favor of kind of random reading. It didn't have to just be books on the poetry oh. industry because, because you get oh, okay. fabulous ideas when you put something yeah. You know, kind of unexpected. And I, I think one of, yeah. yeah, Frank had many secrets of success, but I think the willingness to find ideas everywhere was what it was one of the ingredients. Yeah, exactly. And, and that's I, why I was, I was so, uh, go ahead. You. No, I was going to say, well, that's what I, I love as well about you being on my show is because lifeology, that's what it means. A study of life. We all have life lessons to learn and life lessons to teach. Someone can see me and be like, oh, James, I see you're doing this and I don't want that response, so I'm not going to do that. Or I can see someone and be like, or I can see something you do, Mitzi, and be like, oh my gosh, I love how you do this. Let me practice that myself. So it doesn't matter where we are in life. It doesn't matter where we're, our financial background, our education, et cetera. We all can teach somebody something. And so when you look around and you're aware of what's happening in your surroundings, you'll know, okay, let me try this because that might work for me. Or let me avoid this because someone did this and, and I find out what the, what the payoff is and they didn't like it. So I probably wouldn't like it either. So it's really good to have that awareness that we all can teach each other something. It's just simply you need to keep your eyes open and be, pay attention. <laughs> yeah, he had, he had a lot of humility to him. It didn't mm -hmm. bother him that he didn't know everything. He was just, yeah, uh, yeah. I thought I made up the word, word informivore. Like a carnivore eats meat, an informivore yeah. eats information. I, th yeah. I think I didn't, I felt I made it up, but I, I think the word is just anyway. <laughs> but Frank was a total informivore. Wherever he was, he that. was always just had his eyes open, looking for ways to improve himself, uh, learn more, be better. And good Lord, yeah. the payoff for, for doing that. Again, yeah. a company that started with no employees, 20,000 people at the time of his death. And hmm. I think good ideas played a big role in it. But, you know, the Certainly biggest did. thing is I did finish this book recently. It's on Amazon, The Frank Purdue Way. I wrote it because one day it occurred to me Ta -da, <laughs> that so many of the things that Frank did are things that anybody could do. They're, Certainly. Yeah, once you know them, 
but you don't have to be rich. You don't have to be brilliant. You don't have mm-hmm. to come from a famous family. The things that Frank did were ones that once you know them, anybody can do them. And if you, if you do just one of them, you're ahead of the game. You do all of them yes, and uh, yeah, go be a billionaire. Mm-hmm. <laughs> exactly. I love that. One thing I really did appreciate, well, I, unfortunately, I didn't get a chance to meet this amazing person, of course, but le- reading, reading more about him, he had a lot of, uh, he had personal values that he really instilled in his company. And I think that's something so important because people can be so swayed by the world, by economy, et cetera. But if you don't have any value or you don't have values that are part of your, of your, of who you are, then unfortunately you will be swayed when life happens. Tell us more about the values that were important to Frank. I thought that he had a completely values-driven life. And, oh, I'm pleased that you asked that because that was the final chapter in my brief little book. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, the book is brief, by the way. You can read it in yeah, probably 40 minutes. It's And it's $4, oh, great. so it's not going to break the bank. But the, the values-driven life, when Frank was in his... Mm, early 80s, he was diagnosed with Parkinson's. And you know, that meant that there was an expiration date on his life. Sure. Which, and you know, when that happens to you, you start thinking of, of your legacy and those who come after you. And we were talking about you know, what he wished for those who came after him. And he came to the conclusion, which I endorse and I bet you'd endorse, that a person who has a values-driven life is more likely at the end of their days to look back in their life and feel, I led a good life. Uh, He also felt that having strong values were a recipe for happiness. Mm -hmm. And so some of the values, we we spent three days creating an ethical will. And the point of the ethical will is if you have an estate you put it in a will and you're those who come after you are going to receive material things. Frank thought it was at least as important, maybe more important to give them more kind of spiritual things or at least values things. And so we spent three days writing down probably 50 values that he felt would help people lead, lead a better, mm. happier life. 50 wow. is too many. Who's going to remember 50? So sure. we, <laughs> We condensed it down to 10. And the, the first of these was be honest. I mean, if, if you're an honest person, you have so much better chance of having like good friends for the rest of your life. Or how about having Certainly. a good marriage? Or I mean, just be honest. Number two, and this one was terribly important to me because I think it, it gets to one of the big issues in life. Point number two in his ethical will was be a person whom other people can trust or who are, uh, who, mm-hmm. let me get the exact wording. Be a person whom others are justified in trusting. In other mm-hmm. words, be worthy of trust. Sure. Yes. Uh, he also, he also felt treat all people with respect, no exceptions. And I never saw Frank not follow that. He, mm-hmm. he, he treated everybody, whether it was, I don't know, a sanitation man or the president of the United States, he was going to give you his full respect and attention. And I I just love that. He was, he was, yeah, he was to the core and egalitarian, which reminds Mm. me of what it was like going through the plants with Frank. These are the processing facilities. Yeah. And a typical one, it could have a thousand employees or we call them associates. And I, I used to be just, dazzled by how many names of people he knew. You know, would oh, walk through wow, and he'd introduce me. Yeah, Mitzi, I'd like you to meet Delcy. Delcy's been with us for 32 years and has never had a, a sick a sick day. Or or wow, meet he knew Maisie. All that. Oh he did. He just knew and knew and knew. Or meet Maisie. Her son just got into uh, the college that he wanted to. He he just mm. and I always felt that this gets back to listening. But I always felt when we were going through the plants, hey, he, he, you know, when you've learned somebody's name and he knew thousands and thousands, you know, that's a mark of respect. But it, it, it gets even better. His posture wasn't mm, like the big boss nose in the air. No, mm-hmm. it was sort of as if we're all part of the same team. And 
I very much respect and admire your role. And I know we couldn't do it without you. It was, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't, I'm big and you're not. It's sure, that exactly. we're all important. And I, and I totally value what you do. Cool. Oh, that's, that's amazing. That's absolutely, unfortunately, our time is up, but I've, I've loved talking with you and learning more about Frank Perdue. Oh, I know you. when my, my you, listeners you, purchased the book, when my, when my listeners purchased the book, The Frank Purdue Way, Simple Steps, Super Success, I know that they too will be so even more inspired than what they've heard today. If they do want to purchase the book, which I'm, I 100% endorse, where will they find this information online? Okay, go to Amazon. And it's $4 for a paperback and it's two ninety nine dollars for Kindle. I recommend the paperback, okay. but go for it. Sure. Yes. And if they want to find more information about you, where would they find this information online? Go to mitziperdue.com. And I love to answer Wonderful. email. My listeners all- Oh, excellent. Okay. Well, my listeners also know that if they cannot find this information any other place, simply go to the show notes at jamesmillerlifeology.com for this particular episode, and I will link you with Mitzi Purdue. Thank you so much for being a wonderful guest on my show today. You're welcome back anytime. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I've loved it.